and I'm, I'm going to talk about my work on energy conservation with post selection. So my window into this field of quantum energetics was this uh, paper by Yakir Aharnov, where uh, they consider a particle in a box, and that particle has a wave function, and that wave function has Fourier components. And the Fourier components um, have, a, have a max. So it's band limited. There's a highest frequency. Nevertheless, the uh, particle's wave function oscillates faster than any of the individual frequencies uh, locally near the middle. We say that it super oscillates. Uh, so this raises an interesting question. How is the energy conserved if the particle happens to escape? So if you temporarily open a shutter in that middle, middle area and the particle happens to get out, uh, how is energy conserved because it leaves with an energy higher than it could have had previously. Uh, so how to explain this? Well, the if the particle gets out, then it really can't be alone in the world. Um, so there has to be something external, right? Some kind of apparatus. Um, and so uh, the authors argued that uh, they, they used a kind of locality argument where they said, look, if um, if you have an opener interact locally in this region fast enough, then all that opener really sees is uh, either nothing because the photon isn't there or a uh, gamma photon because that's all the wave function looks like over there. Uh, and if it does see the gamma photon, right, then it has to kind of, kind of react as if it really is a gamma photon uh, and in some sense give no energy. Uh, even if the particle gets out. Okay, so that's kind of shown here. You might suspect that you mean the local opener gives no energy. Yes, the local opener gives no energy. So uh, you might suspect that there's a shift of energy of the opener in the case that the, uh, the particle escapes, but they have uh, a model that uh, says that this is not the case. Uh, so how is energy conserved? Uh, well, it's conserved over the ensemble of outcomes. So in fact, most of the time, the particle doesn't get out. Uh, and if it doesn't get out, then its wave function is zeroed out near that middle area. And that affects the, uh, affects the energy. Uh, so it's, it's hard to see, but uh, this final energy distribution, if the particle does not escape, it's actually slightly shifted relative to the initial uh, energy distribution of the photon. I don't know if I'm saying all the words right, but uh, yes. Uh, so in some sense, the particle is sourcing its own energy over the ensemble of outcomes. Uh, but you definitely do need the opener. Uh, so the possible energy shift of the photon is by this amount alpha. And so here's the, what happens to the energy of the particle escapes. Uh, and actually, the energy distribution of the opener is uncertain by an amount greater than alpha. So that's this here. You see that the spread is uh, more than alpha. So the apparatus acts as a catalyst. It requires this energy uncertainty, um, which other speakers here have already kind of talked about. Um, yeah, the apparatus's energy uncertainty permits the photon's energy to change because the possible energy shift of the photon is contained within the spread of the opener's energy distribution. Um, this is just kind of a statement that the gamma photon cannot escape without the opener. Okay, so this is one example that I think says a lot about energy conservation in quantum mechanics, but there are plenty of other things that we could uh, think about. Um, plenty of cases where the measurement apparatus really does have to source energy and act as a battery. Uh, and you know, there's this literature that many people <laughs> here are a part of on quantum measurement engines. Uh, you know, for example, 
Uh, in this image, uh, we have a particle which can be lifted against the potential by checking if it's above a certain height. And if it is above that height, you can kind of lift uh, your um, ground potential with no resistance um, and increase the potential energy of the particle. So there, energy seems to come from uh, measurement itself. Uh, even with a simple qubit, we can consider an example where we start in the ground state, measure some observable that does not commute with energy, um, and therefore increase the mean energy of the, the qubit. There, since the mean energy of the qubit really goes up, energy really must come from some external source. And uh, I want to understand uh, the energy change of the source. It's really what this talk is about. Uh, even with the qubit, there's, uh, as Cater uh, tried to show us, is that there's a lot of different scenarios we can consider, different initial states, choices of measurement basis. Uh, you can start in the ground state, measure something that does not meet with energy. You can start with un energy uncertainty and measure energy. Um, and then you can have both. You could start with energy uncertainty and measure something that does not commute with energy. And it'd be nice to understand the energetics in each case. And uh, I'm focusing on this panel because while these have much symmetry to them, uh, in this case, there's kind of an asymmetry between the possible final states in red and the initial state in blue. Uh, so one final state is more likely than the other. And so what happens when you get that outcome as opposed to the other one? All right, so the subject for this talk is energy conservation in quantum measurement with the understanding that the measurement apparatus can act as a battery for the measured system. Post-selection refers to focusing on specific measurement outcomes. And the question I'm most interested in is how does the energy change the apparatus depend on the post look. All right, so I'm going to phrase everything in terms of this nice example for illustrative purposes. So here we have a qubit in the block sphere representation. Its initial state is a state of maximal energy uncertainty. And the ground state is at the bottom pole. So suppose we measure spin along some axis labeled F for final. We could get the upper outcome, which corresponds to some energy gain, or we could get the lower outcome, which corresponds to some energy loss. Now, really, this is a measurement of an observable that does not commute with energy. So neither of these two final states has a well-defined energy. But we can say that mean energy increases in one case and decreases in the other. Uh, so this was all drawn to scale and describes a situation in which the upper outcome is achieved with probability five sixth, and the lower outcome is achieved with probability one sixth. And more often than not, the uh, mean energy of the qubit goes up. And if we were to average over six trials, uh, not average over six trials, if we were to perform six trials, <laughs> the uh, expected energy change of the qubit is these four units. There's five positive units and one negative one. This energy must come from somewhere, presumably from the measurement apparatus. So the expected energy change of the measurement apparatus per six trials uh, is also four units, but negative. Okay, but how does the measurement apparatus's energy change with each outcome? In other words, if we were to redraw this diagram and assign uh, energy shift to the apparatus delta HM, for each possibility, each roll of the dice, what would that be? How full would these bars be? And would they be green or red, positive or negative? And just as a reminder, focusing on a particular outcome is called post-selection. All right, so some interesting questions jump out immediately. Uh, is the uh, conditioned energy shift of the apparatus equal and opposite to that of the measured system? Uh, and is the result that one gets for the energy shift of the apparatus with post-selection protocol independent? 
So the first question I say probably not. Uh, that's not actually what we saw with the uh, super oscillation case. Uh, we saw that you could get this gamma photon out uh, without a commensurate energy shift of the opener. And as for the protocol independency, I say we'll see. Uh, I think my public answer usually is we find that we don't get protocol independency, <laughs> but I'm still a bit confused about this one. Um, and it'd be fun to talk about. Uh, so the caveat to all this is that the measurement apparatus is kind of a weird battery. You know, it doesn't actually have a well-defined amount of energy. So we have this weight theorem, uh, which says that to measure observables that don't meet with energy accurately, we need to have some oncilla of energy uncertainty. So the battery's uh, energy should be uncertain for the sorts of interesting measurements that we want to perform. Uh, even if it has an uncertain energy, it does have a mean energy. And that mean energy can increase or decrease. Uh, and that's what we want to quantify. Okay, so we can quantify the mean energy shift of the measurement apparatus. You can do this for different protocols and compare to figure out if there's protocol independent results or not. Uh, and we want to use measurement models that respect energy conservation at some level so that we're really studying energy conservation in quantum mechanics. Uh, so here's a, a new slide that I've never shown before. Uh, what is an energy conserving measurement model? Well, it's a von Neumann model that treats the apparatus quantum mechanically. And the apparatus has a Hamiltonian. So the apparatus can actually store energy. Um, so there's a way to track the apparatus's energy in the model. Uh, and then there's like two, two key ingredients. Uh, the second of which I don't see emphasized that often, but the first is that the unitary dynamics that couples the system and the apparatus should conserve uh, some additive uh, energy observable. Okay, so there's a system energy, an apparatus energy, a sum to some total energy that the operator should be conserved. And I list a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one is an autonomous model. Uh, I guess, for example, the collisional models that you guys have been talking about. Uh, also, quantum clock models, if you've heard of that. Uh, you could use an interaction Hamiltonian that is time dependent, but commutes with the total energy. That would also uh, preserve the energy uh, total. Uh, or less restrictively, you might use a unitary that commutes with the total energy. These are actually, the second and third are not actually the same. Uh, one is kind of a subset of the other. Okay. Now, the second ingredient, I would say, is that the points are observable, uh, commutes with the total energy. And the, the reasoning for this is that you know, at some level, we can monitor, we can uh, model the unitary dynamics, uh, but we have a collapsed postulate in quantum mechanics, and we don't want there to be any untracked energy leakage due to that collapse. If you have this condition, then when you measure your pointer, suppose you don't read the pointer's value, you actually won't change the total energy. So if you have these two conditions, then the measurement does not change the energy probability distribution, the total energy probability distribution, assuming you marginalize over the possible pointer outcomes. So S and M, the system of interest and the apparatus can exchange energy. Uh, and the energy change of the system is explained by the apparatus. And the energy change of the apparatus is explained by the system. There's, there could be an environment that maybe performs this uh, measurement of the pointer, but it's not really necessary to track its, uh, its energy flow. Um, 
in order to explain the changes of energies of the system and the apparatus. So. Okay, whoops. So the, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about two energy conserving measurement models, the quantum clock model and the James Cummings model. I'll give results for the mean energy change of the measurement apparatus in each, relating back to the dice example. I'll talk about some similarities and differences between the two models and also try to offer additional insights. Uh, so here's the quantum clock model. So it's an autonomous model. So uh, it conserves energy as a time independent Hamiltonian. And it's also a three body model. So there's the qubit being measured, a quantum clock, which is a one dimensional continuous system. The clock can store energy and act as a battery. And there's a pointer qubit that stores the measurement outcome. So, what happens in this model is that the clock wave function translates to the right at a velocity v due to its uh, Hamiltonian, which is proportional to p. And eventually, it hits this uh, interaction region here in the middle. And this triggers a pointer flip conditional on whether the qubit is in the state at. All right, and then the clock wave function just continues going to the right with velocity v. Uh, and what this protocol does is it measures the projector at f. So it, it checks if the qubit is some, in some state f. And you know, ultimately, that is equivalent to really measuring any sigma n of the, the qubit. Okay, so for most of the time, yeah. How does this model act as a clock? Like what is the mechanism or so we call it a quantum clock model because uh the right the displacement of the clock's cube is proportional to v and time. So what, what is the clock? What is keeping the time? So if you like this is like a, a toy model where the clock is. Uh, a toy that helps the model work. Alternatively, you could think you could maybe think about it as you have a massive particle and you're operating in some regime, expanding expanding about some average momentum. I think the question is rather about the world being. This is a wording that's it's it's in this paper by Don okay. Cruzado. So I mean. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Starting from a position, you can also say the time to the final position if it is very sharp in position. They, you have a, yeah, that's true. being sharp in position, but x equals zero, p equals zero. Then after a certain time, you will be a sharp position at x equal uh, v times t. That's why I that so, so if you wrap the line in a circle, it would be like the hands of a clock going around like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So for most of time, the clock wave function isn't in this interaction region. Right? It's not the origin. So the energy really is just a sum of two terms for most of time, the qubit term and the clock term. And energy can be exchanged between the two subsystems. Right. And this uh, total energy term, what I'm calling the total energy term, is something that is pointer independent, uh, right? So this operator commutes with uh, the pointer observables, and this thing, the, the Anasi condition, really, is satisfied. So that was another important component of an energy conserving measurement model. Okay, so. Roughly speaking, what happens in the model is that you start with a separable state of qubit, pointer, and clock. Uh, you evolve it under the time independent Hamiltonian, and you get an entangled superposition where, in one branch, the pointer has flipped and the qubit is in the state f, and in the other branch, the pointer has not flipped and the qubit is in the state orthogonal to f. So this is your like, standard von Neumann model. Uh, but there's kind of an approximation that goes on because we're measuring something that doesn't commute with energy. 
which we can't do perfectly according to the weight there. All right, so in going from line one to line two, the qubit energy change is compensated by that at the clock uh, because we have a completely time independent Hamiltonian. We're just evolving under that. However, we can look a bit closer at the uh, mean energy of the clock in the F branch. Okay, subtract the initial mean energy of the clock. Uh, and in some limit, this asymptotically approaches this expression, which depends on qubit properties alone. And interestingly involves this quantity called the qubit energy weak value, even though we're not deliberately measuring the qubit energy weakly. So let's go back to the dice example and see what we found. So we've found these uh, energy shifts of the apparatus for each possibility, each roll of the dice. And because we've all we've constructed everything in this energy conserving way, uh, when we sum the energy shifts of the apparatus for each possibility, we build up an energy change which compensates that of the qubit for six trials. All right. So we, we knew this had to be the case, uh, but now we have an outcome by outcome breakdown of the energy balance. And this energy balance does not hold for particular post selections. So in particular with this uh, roll of the dice six, uh, we have that the qubit energy decreases and that the apparatus energy also decreases. So that's not equal and opposite, both are negative. And that may seem weird, uh, it gets even weirder. So the mean energy shift of the uh, clock or the apparatus need not even be bounded by the level spacing of the qubit. This can happen if you have a, an especially rare outcome. Uh, as is shown in this scenario. Here, the energy shift of the apparatus is extremely large. Uh, and to recover the energy balance, you have to look at the outcome that almost always happens, um, in which there's actually a slight energy increase. Uh, I would argue that the clock model actually does have some really nice properties, though. So. For example, if you measure the qubit's energy, you find that the apparatus's energy does not need to shift. Does not shift. That kind of makes sense. You're measuring energy, so why should the apparatus provide energy? Uh, yeah, similarly, if you prepare the qubit in an energy eigenstate and you measure something that doesn't commute with energy, uh, then you find that the energy change of the qubit is compensated by that of the apparatus, even for post selection. So uh, here we do have the equal and opposite phenomena. It's kind of like saying that if you have a well defined energy for your qubit at the beginning, then energy changes of it have to be explained by some outside source. And here it's kind of explained in detail, outcome by outcome. So these nice properties beg the question of whether the clock result is completely general. In other words, is this formula uh, universal? Uh, and I said that the public answer was no. <laughs> so we looked at alternative models uh, and they gave different results, <clears throat> but general trends do apply. So in particular, this bit of this uh, stuff about not equal and opposite anomalous shifts, those are those apply pretty generally. It's important to remember that the weight theorem forbids perfect measurements of observables that do not commute with energy. So really what we have are a bunch of measurement models that or, or measurement protocols that attempts to perform some targeted measurement, and they're never quite doing it right. Uh, and there are various you know attempts at Performing the target measurement have differences that amount to energetic consequences. 
So our motivations for studying alternative models were twofold. We also wanted to have something that was relevant to experiment. Uh, for example, something you could study on a QED setup. And uh, well, this is the experiment I, I knew of before coming to the meeting. <laughs> so uh, in Benjamin Ward's group, they studied a case where you start with a qubit in the ground state. You perform some rotation using a pulse. And uh, if the pulse has a large uh, energy uncertainty, then you know this approximates a, a pure rotation pretty well, but it's not exactly a pure rotation. It creates uh, an entangled state. So there's a, um, the drive kind of, the final state of the drive kind of depends on whether the qubit is in the ground or the excited state. Uh, so they, they do this drive, and then they also uh, measure the energy of the qubit. And they're able to figure out the energy change of the drive conditioned on whether the qubit actually ended up excited or not. So you might think, you might think that if I started with the qubit in the ground state and I ended with the qubit in the ground state, that the drive lost zero photons. Uh, but that's not actually the case uh, if you work out the map uh, with just like a toy James Cummings model. Similarly, if the qubit starts in the ground state and ends in the excited state, you would expect that the drive loses one photon. Uh, but if you, again, if you work out the map in a toy James Cummings model, you find a different answer. And the uh, experiment actually kind of weighs in favor of, you know, these tangents and cotangent expressions rather than the zero and negative one. Okay, so this was not exactly uh, like a measurement model, but you can take kind of the same physics and make a measurement model out of it. Uh, so suppose your goal is to measure uh, whether the qubit's in this state f, and you're limited by the fact that you can only measure energy directly. Okay. Uh, however, you do have access to a drive, so you can, you can couple to some oscillator and perform rotations of the qubit. So what you want to do is you want to perform a drive rotation that maps F to E, then measure qubit energy, and then perform the drive that maps E to F. Right, so you can see that if you start with the qubit in F, it gets driven to E, the energy measurement puts it in E, and then the drive takes it back to F. So this leaves the state F alone, and uh, similarly, it leaves the state orthogonal to F alone as well. So it's a faithful measurement in this sense. Uh, with the caveat being that the drive rotations are imperfect. Um, this is also kind of related to the weight theorem. Okay, so in what sense is this an energy conserving measurement model? Well, you have uh, a total number of excitations, the qubit, and the oscillator, and that commutes with the James Cummings Hamiltonian. So the interaction conserves excitation number, in that sense, it conserves energy. Uh, furthermore, the at least in this model, at the, le the level where we kind of stop modeling things is the, uh, the energy measurement, measurement of the qubit's energy, but that also commutes with the total excitation number. So that's fine as well. Uh, so the energy change of the qubit should be explained by the oscillator, and the energy change of the oscillator should be explained by the qubit at some level. All right, so we can uh, see how this applies to the uh, dice example and figure out these uh, energy shifts of the apparatus. Uh, for if you were to perform your measurements this way, and you get different results from the clock model. 
And in fact, you kind of see an anomalous energy shift here with this six outcome that we didn't have before. <clears throat> but still, if you add up the energy shift of the apparatus for each outcome, you build up uh, an amount that compensates the energy increase if you keep it. Uh, and actually, even within the Jane Scummies model, there are actually multiple ways to perform this uh, measurement, right? You could actually use different drive angles, which are related uh, by um, multiples of pi, basically. And you get different results here as well. So even within the James Tommy's model, there's a kind of protocol dependency. <clears throat> but still, the energy change of the qubit is accounted for. So the general findings, things that are common to both models are that total mean energy changes when you post-select. The mean energy change of the apparatus does not balance that of the qubit until all outcomes are considered. Anomalous energy shifts are possible. That's all. Uh, so, why do the models give different results? Uh, so, part of this was uh, explained in the uh, paper by Benjamin Ward's group, um, where they did the experiment driving a qubit and measuring the energy change of the drive. Um, but I kind of elaborated on that in my my paper. So, the James Gummy Hamiltonian uh, is non-degenerate, and this this turns out to be important. Right, so it has eigenvalues that scale like the square root of n. And you could imagine performing uh, this same protocol without the James Cummings interaction, instead replacing these A's and A daggers by lowering and raising operators that don't carry these factors of square root of n. With such a coupling, you can still perform this type of protocol. And it turns out that if you do, you get the clock result back. So why does the spectrum of the James Cummings Hamiltonian matter? Uh, so suppose you have a, uh, a qubit and an oscillator and the oscillator may be uh, in the ground state, or it may be in uh, the first excited state. And let's say you have only have access to uh, energy measurements of the qubit and control of the interaction strength between the qubit and oscillator. And you're just working with this uh, energy conserving uh, interaction Hamiltonians, the James Cummings one. Uh, the question is, could you tell kind of if you're in this realm where right, we're having vacuum Rabi oscillations, or if you're in this realm where you have n equals one Rabi oscillations? And the point is that you can because the n equals one Rabi oscillations are faster. So this results in different excitation probabilities that you could gain information by measuring whether or not your qubit's excited at certain times. Right. So uh, this intuition, again, doesn't come from me, but basically what happens is that higher photon numbers overshoot the targeted rotation. Right. So uh, in this case, where the drive rotation is in purple, uh, a higher photon, if you start with a, this initial state here and you use a higher photon number, that actually is more likely to produce the outcome E. Uh, and this actually ends up being a positive contribution to the mean photon number shift. Okay. So you would think that exciting, exciting a qubit uh, you know, by its nature, you know, I'm losing an excitation, um, but there's actually kind of a statistical sense in which uh, the photon number is increasing if you get the excited out. 
Now, why degenerate coupling makes a difference is that now the vacuum Rossi, Rabi oscillation and then the n equals one Rabi oscillation have the same speed. And so you, you can no longer tell which uh, realm you're in. There's this, you don't have this statistical Bayesian kind of effect. And then you get the clock result back. So this is kind of a kind of a summary, if you will. So these expressions on the left characterize the uh, the photon number change of the drive with the James Cummings model. If you were to start in some, uh, let's say, the ground state of the qubit and end up in some other state of the qubit, like the excited state. So this course this uh, corresponds to the experimental data that I showed earlier. Um, on the other hand, if you were to use a degenerate interaction in order to perform these rotations, uh, you would get these results on the right, which are perhaps far more intuitive. Uh, right. So if the if you start in the ground state of the qubit and you go to the excited state, then the drive loses one quantum. Uh, and actually, I was able to kind of take these quantities and incorporate them into some general expression that gives the energy shift of the uh, apparatus. So actually, if you, if you plug in say, these degenerate interaction results into this formula, you actually get the clock result back. That's my point. Um, similarly, if you plug in the these uh, These quantities for the James Cummings interaction, you get the James Cummings result back. So, the way I see the experimental landscape now is that we have an experiment that uh, kind of partially verifies this uh, energy conservation for quantum measurement um, by uh, verifying these two expressions in blue. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge, at this time, we haven't explored all these other quantities, and we haven't linked everything to this um, more general expression. So that would be cool to see in the future. Okay, so we have this uh, expression for the mean energy shift of the clock, and it involves the weak value. Of the qubit Hamiltonian uh, to suggest that there may be some analogy with weak measurement. So here's the analogy. So in deliberate weak measurement, we have some uh, pointer variable Q, whereas uh, the energy when we just perform these measurements that respect energy conservation, we have a similar thing: the the energy of the apparatus. This pointer variable Q has an uncertainty in weak measurement, and we need an apparatus that has energy uncertainty because of the weight there. All right, so uh, in one case, we deliberately measure some uh, observable weak weight. Uh, and the pointer shift measures that uh, observable. Here, the energy shift of the apparatus, in some sense, measures the energy shift of the qubit due to a strong measurement because it must be opposite. In deliberate weak measurement, we have some interaction which translates the pointer. In the cases we've been considering, we have a strong measurement which uh, drags the apparatus's energy because you have a conservation law uh, that must be satisfied. Uh, and we have anomalous values in both cases. And just to note, I mean, this is, 
you can think of this uh, expression that I got for the clock energy shift as, in some sense, being a weak measurement of the qubits energy shift. That's equal and opposite to the qubits weak energy shift. Okay, and sorry if this slide was uh, tough to follow, but uh, something I want to suggest is that uh, on the left-hand side, we're deliberately measuring something weakly. Uh, on the right-hand side, these consequences are just unavoidable because you have a conservation law that needs to be satisfied. So if you like, if you have energy conservation, then the environments of the system you're measuring always acts as an energetic witness for the system being measured. That's just unavoidable because you have a conservation law. So in summary, we constructed measurement models that respect energy conservation in two different ways. You're able to analyze the change in the energy of the measurement apparatus when a particular measurement outcome is achieved. We found that mean energy is not conserved for a specific outcome, only when all outcomes are considered. And that anomalous shifts are possible, similar to weak values. Also, we found that the particular measurement approach used affects the apparatus energy. So with that, thank you. Any questions?